All right. And welcome everybody again to the first Anatomy Regional Tutoring Session. We're so happy to have you here. A couple of updates uh, since the local competition. First, congratulations to everybody. We are so impressed by how amazing your commitment is and the dedication you put in. It is just truly awesome that you're spending, you know, your free time as high schoolers to do this. And I, I think, you know, any colleges that would be uh, reviewing your applications would be impressed too. So a couple of important deadlines um, for the ABITS travel stipend. Uh, we should have some uh, reviewers looking over those soon and can give you guys some, uh, you know, hopefully some quick turnaround notice on that and uh, provide our winners with that, their updates. We did extend the regional registration to March 15th. So if you had not registered yet, there still is time to do so. And we're so excited to have you at each of our regional uh, competition sites. So really looking forward to that. Um, certificates for participants were sent out on uh, Friday this past weekend. So if you didn't receive that, please email us. We are more than happy to make sure that you get that and send you your certificate individually if there's any issues with your emails or access to that. Uh, we also shared that Anatomy Connected uh, 2024 conference is happening, and that's happening later this month, uh, this month March 22nd to 25th. Um, if you guys can't make it, uh, registration is free, but we understand that that's uh, international travel and might not be feasible for everybody. Um, just a fun organization to uh, be a part of and someone who's funding this inaugural year of competition. Uh, if you can't attend, then please watch for social media for the hashtag Anatomy Connected hashtag. Um, and then finally, we have our research survey. Uh, we sent instructions for that if anyone would be willing to participate in that completely voluntary 15-minute uh, survey. So look out for our news post for all that information. So with that, um, any other updates from Drs. Haggerty or Peterson that I missed? I will say that we do have, unfortunately, um, I wish we could extend, extend the Abbott's application, but because we have committed reviewers um, on a deadline, we are, we're not able to. Um, but we will try to get um, the reviews done by next weekend and have our awardees uh, notified by Sunday the 17th. And Dr. Piscara, I was just going to remind everybody that you updated the website and um, all of the regional hosts have reached out to those of you uh, um, invited to their um, regional host site. But you might be interested in just going um, on the website and looking at where the other regional competitions are going to be held. But there's some really important information about what kind of subtests are going to be included in the regional competitions. And I would highly encourage all of you to really get familiar with those sort of those uh, descriptions of the subtests. So I'll turn things over to Dr. Peterson to introduce our first speaker for the uh, for the evening, someone that you all know and love from previous sessions. <laughs> So it is my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Bill Frank. He is currently um, at the University of Drexel College of Medicine. We're on the West Reading campus. He um, participates in the first and second year curriculum. Um, he is an associate professor and he deals with all things anatomical sciences. And I think in this first uh, presentation where he reviews and introduces you to some elevated concepts, uh, fundamentals of anatomy, histology, and embryology, you will see um, and appreciate his expertise. So Dr. Frank, so glad to have you and please go ahead and get started. Okay, well, thank you for that very nice introduction. I'm gonna try to live up to that. So can you see my screen and see my cursor? Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone and congratulations to everyone. Um, I am going to be talking about some fundamentals of anatomy, histology, and embryology, just trying to um, hopefully jog your memory a little bit. There'll be some few new things, but a lot of review. Um, so we'll be following the objectives. And I've tried to put these objectives at the beginning of each session section so that you can review them. So our first section is going to be on uh, anatomy, but basically radiologic anatomy. So obviously the definition is the study of structure and function of the body using medical imaging techniques. And there are many techniques. We're gonna talk about four uh, that are the most common. First is uh, X-ray imaging or conventional radiology. The next will be a step up from that, computerized tomography, also known as CT. 
uh, then ultrasonography and followed uh, last by magnetic resonance imaging. So all of these differ. Each is based on the receipt of attenuated beams of energy to create images and to permit the observation of internal anatomy structure and function. So the first thing we're going to look at is x-ray. So in an x-ray, there's a beam of x-ray that passes through the body and ends up on a detector. So this x-ray beam passes through the body to the detector. So tissues of different densities appear differently. So if a tissue is more dense, uh, that means that less x-ray is going to reach the detector. And so it is going to appear brighter or whiter upon the image. And we can see here that there's some things that look very bright, kind of like bone, okay? So those are considered radiopaque. So the tissue that's less dense, uh, more of the x-ray is going to reach the detector and it looks darker on the image. And those are considered radiolucent. So we can see the soft tissue, like the lung fields in between the ribs look um, very dark in comparison to the bright white of the uh, vertebral column. Some tissue that's in between, like the diaphragm, and on the right side is the liver, we can see an outline of the heart and even some of the parts of the hilum of the lung. So you can see that different densities will give us different um, uh, look on, on x-ray film. So the best use for x-ray is the skeletal system. Uh, which you're going to be seeing a lot more of uh, here in a little while. So it's really good to see bones, not so good for soft tissue, um, but it is low cost. It's easily accessible and most medical facilities have x-ray units. You can even add media such as barium or iodine to highlight soft tissue though, which we do sometimes in the GI tract and especially in arteries and veins. Okay, so that's x-ray. So commuted Tomography or CT or CT scan is really just a glorified x-ray, except it is a three-dimensional x-ray. So the x-ray beam is passed through the body as before, but it rotates around the long axis of the body to create a three-dimensional image. The overlapping uh, absorption are measured and recorded by a computer. Uh, to determine the radio densities of each tissue, and that can be manipulated to see soft tissue um, a little bit better. So it's a bit better than the regular x-ray imaging. Um, the computer then maps the images and display it in a 3D manner. We can see here on the top images, we see a sagittal section through the lower thoracic and lumbar spine. You can even see the liver there. Here in a, a coronal or frontal view, we can actually see the kidneys and laying right next to the lumbar spine, see the pelvis, but we do see some of the top soft tissue, the gluteal musculature here. And then in a cross section, uh, we will see uh, this uh, area, uh, like we're cutting you in two and looking up the, the top half. So on the right side, we'll see the liver Okay. And on the back side, we see the paraspinal muscles and the kidneys. Okay, so this gives us a lot more uh, information, um, gives a little bit more uh, information on soft tissue, but it's still very good for skeletal muscle. Um, the brain, especially for uh, bleeds uh, and, and swelling in and around the brain, CT is very good. It's less, it's more expensive than x-ray, but much less expensive than the MRI uh, that we'll talk about a little bit. And most hospitals and large clinics have it. Um, they can also ask, add contrast media to show things, but they can also do something really cool, which I like here, and I like how it's rotating around to keep your attention off of my face. Um, this new technology allows you to reformat images and create three-dimensional images, and you can even isolate things. Like here, we have the aorta, uh, we have the kidneys, and we can see a lot of the vascular tree in the abdomen. So that is CT scan. Next, we'll move on to ultrasound. And ultrasound is 
not using x-ray, it's using a sound wave. And the sound wave goes through a transducer through the body and it bounces off of deeper tissue and re rebounds back to the transducer. Once it does, that is going to create an image that will then come up on a screen in real time. Okay, so you can manipulate the image to view it in different planes and in real time. You can actually even use Doppler ultrasonography to show shifts in frequencies and measure of motion, direction, and velocities of moving objects, especially blood flow. Okay, so this is much better for soft tissue. Obviously, the deeper the structures are, the more difficult they are to see, but more superficial structures they're excellent for. Um, this is excellent to use when radiation is contraindicated, such as in a fetal ultrasound. It is low cost and it is easily accessible. There's no radiation and it can be performed virtually anywhere. And now there's those little bedside ultrasound units that you literally can put it in your back pocket and go wherever you want to go. And we can see a nice ultrasound uh, image uh, in real time of the heart. And we see the two people there clapping uh, for, for us for studying. Uh, actually, those are heart valves and the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left atrium, left ventricle. And so I would ask you, what are the valves here between the clapping hands? What is the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle? Uh, you can leave this in the chat. And what is the valve between the left atrium and left ventricle? So give you a little quiz there for yourself. Okay. The last one is magnetic resonance imaging uh, or MRI. Uh, this uses large magnets to create images. It does not use x-ray. It does not use sound wave. Okay. So a person is placed in a large round magnet and the um, MRI unit is pulsed off and on, and this is going to create radio waves. Uh, and um, the free protons in the tissue become aligned with the magnetic field when it's on. So when they are excited, they they're flipped by a radio wave pulse, and then this is turned off and on. And as it's turned off and on, there is a proton that that uh, clicks off of the um, of the basically the water molecules and this energy is released and detected by the computer and so because of that tissues with high proton density such as fat and water they will appear white where tissue in with uh, lower proton density such as bone appear dark and we can see here in the image the bone uh, of the humerus, the head of the humerus, and around it we can see the deltoid muscle and subscapular muscle and the rotator cuff muscles, even showing a possible rotator cuff injury there on the tendon. Okay, and if you're really into it, if I'm not, I've never seen purple muscle, but if it did, it would probably look like that. Um, but you can modify the image to create uh, all sorts of, of uh, nice uh, imaging and contrast. It should be noted that moving fluid, blood, uh, especially moves too quickly for protons to be detected, and therefore they will look dark on MRI. So by the time they flip back and forth, they've already moved past where the um, where the detection is, and so it won't be picked up. So best use is for soft tissue. It's excellent for brain and muscle, tendon, and ligament. Um, it is very good when radiation is contraindicated or uh, when ultrasound is insufficient. Um, it is much more expensive, however, and less accessible, um, only in large hospitals and large health facilities. And because of the high price tag, you probably have to pre-certify for insurance, which sometimes can certainly be a, um, some would say a contraindication to using it because they won't let you do it if you can't prove medical necessity. So anyway, that is the four main imaging, okay? So let's go into histology. So reviewing histology, the connective tissue is one of four tissue types and is categorized as either specialized or proper. 
Connective tissue are, are defined as widely spaced cells embedded in extracellular matrix. Blood, remember, is a specialized form of connective tissue, and is, we'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later. Connective tissue proper supports and protects other tissues and structures by, as the name implies, holding them together. It is composed of transient cells, resonant cells, and extracellular matrix containing ground substance and various fibers. And remember that most connective tissue is highly vascularized. So permanent cells that we would see um, are adipocytes, which we see here and here. Um, and they synthesize, store, and release fats. Fibroblasts are cellular factories that produce the fibers of the extracellular matrix. So we see that here. And we see the fibrocyte, which is just a less active form of the fibroblast. Okay, transient cells of the connective tissue include cells related to immune response of the body and comprise much of what we think about as white blood cells. So we can see macrophages here. Okay, so that will be something that wouldn't normally be in there. It has to come out of the blood and into the tissue. The fibers of connected tissue can be divided into three categories, the collagen, um, reticular, and elastic. Okay, so collagen fibers, which we see here, okay, which are all within here, all these squiggly lines are collagen fibers. Uh, they provide the extracellular matrix and resist being stretched or compressed. So they're kind of the, the rebar, I guess, of, of the uh, extracellular matrix. While there's different types of collagen, I think we talked about three, and in brief, they were type one, which is the most common and can be found in bone, tendons, and ligaments. Type two can be found in cartilage, and type four relates to the epithelial basement membrane. Okay, so cells that make reticular fibers are fibroblasts, and reticular connective tissues form the scaffolding for uh, cells of other organs, especially you'll see that in lymph nodes and in bone marrow. And the last thing are the elastic fibers. And as the name suggests, it allows the tissue to stretch and recoil, return to its original shape. So we see all of those things within this nice uh, cartoon. Okay, so let's move here. So when we look at um, the uh, collag uh, collagenous connective tissue, these can be divided into loose areolar, dense regular, and dense irregular connective tissue. So loose areolar tissue or, or fibers and are found throughout the body. They surround blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, nerves, and can be found in the upper regions of the dermis and the deep layer of the skin. This is the most abundant type of connective tissue. All three fibers are usually present with fibroblasts and with ground substance. So we will see the collagen fibers, we will see the elastic fibers, and we will see the reticular fibers here. So we can see the collagen fibers, the elastic fibers, and the reticular fibers, okay? So adipocytes, uh, uh, the adipose is uh, comprised of cells that appear to be empty so you can see these appear to be empty, but they really shouldn't be. Um, they usually have a small nucleus at the edge of the um, cell, okay? With the process of preservation, they use alcohol to uh, preserve these slides. So that strips out the actual lipid within these cells, and that's why they typically look empty. They're not empty, okay? Okay. So next one, reticular fibers are found in organs related to blood maturation and aging, such as bone marrow, lymph nodes, and spleen. They're very fine fibers of type three collagen uh, observed. We can see it in the cartoon, and then we can see all these really dark squiggly lines in through here. Uh, these are best seen with specialized staining techniques, and they will reveal the dark reticular fibers that are used as attachment fibers for cells in the tissue. Okay, 
So dense regular tissue here on the left is um, found in structures such as ligaments and tendons, and it's closely spaced, mostly type 1 collagen with parallel orientation, and also the cell nuclei of the fibroblasts are uh, oriented in the same way in that parallel arrangement. So we can see here in the cartoon, we have the collagen fibers and the fibroblasts or fibrocytes are also very parallel. So this is looks like sheets of, of tissue. Okay, you can see all those sheets. That is uh, dense regular connective tissue. In contrast, dense irregular connective tissue is found deeper in the regions of the skin, uh, in the area of the dermis, as you can see here is the epidermis in the dermis. So all of this is uh, dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay. It does also uh, encase some of the organs. Uh, it's densely spaced fibers, mostly type 1 collagen fibers uh, that are not in parallel. So unlike the dense regular, the dense irregular, they're all over the place, okay? They look like a meshwork or a, a woven mesh, okay? So you can see that here, that these collagen fibers are uh, irregular in that they're not organized like the dense regular. So a very different contrast between the two, okay? So remember I said that blood is a form of connective tissue, which it is. It's comprised of various cell types suspended in a fluid called plasma. By volume, peripheral blood is approximately 55% plasma, 45% red blood cells, and less than 1% are comprised of white blood cells and platelets. Okay, so red and white blood cells uh, as well as platelets have a common origin. The process of differentiation is known as hematopoiesis. A multipotent cell in the bone marrow can divide into one of the two uh, cell types, either myeloid, which we see here, which are gonna give rise to the red blood cells, white blood cells, and also lymphoid. Um, cells. So myeloid stem cells can further differentiate into the different types of red blood cells known as erythrocytes, um, platelets, okay, from the megakaryocytes. Um, then, of course, the eosinophils, the neutrophils, basophils, and monocytes. Um, the monocytes uh, will become macrophages within the tissue when they leave the bloodstream. Lymphoid cells uh, differentiate into plasma cells, T cells, and natural killer cells, or NK cells. Okay. So blood production is called hematopoiesis, and vessel production is called vasculogenesis. Uh, they begin in structures outside the embryo proper called the yolk sac, Corian and connecting stalk beginning about uh, the 15th to 16th day of fertilization. So we can see here this area of the developing embryo and this thing looks like a blackberry or a raspberry is the creation of the blood islands, which you're going to see on the outside of the developing embryo. During the first few weeks, blood vessels begin to form within this tissue. Um, and the precursor cells are known as hemangioblasts, which then turn into angioblasts, and that's what's going to form the blood vessels. Um, and the pluripotent stem cells are going to differentiate into one or the other of those. Together, these cells form masses known as blood islands scattered throughout the embryonic disc, and the spaces appear in the blood islands that develop into the lumen of the uh, blood vessels. Okay, so we can see them from the outside. We see a cross section. We see them developing. Also note where the heart primordium is. It's also located in the, the um, cranial end of this region. And this is going to be what is going to develop into the heart tube. Okay. So for the first few months, the the uh, hemopoietic activity is occurring in this yolk sac. 
Uh, then from months two to seven, it shifts to the liver and spleen um, as they take over that function. Uh, cells from the liver then colonize the bone marrow in the seventh month and of gestation, which eventually takes over the process. So blood cells start in the um, in in the uh, the blood islands. Uh, they end up uh, the uh, red blood cell formation then is going to shift to the liver and the spleen and eventually into the bone marrow. Okay. So erythrocytes are going to be used for um, oxygen binding, uh, and this oxygen is going to get distributed through the red blood cells in the systemic circulation. Leukocytes are white blood cells, and they are considered the immune cells. And the platelet cells are what are going to initiate blood clotting. Okay, so we have a nice chart here of all the different parts of the uh, uh, blood cell lines, uh, including the erythrocytes and the platelets, and then also the leukocytes. And the leukocytes are separated into two forms, agranulocytes and granulocytes. So we have this funny little mnemonic that I think is kind of cute. He's kind of cute with his banana there. Um, and it is, it reads, never let monkeys eat bananas. And that stands for neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Okay, you also see some numbers on the other side of this. This is telling you relatively what percentage uh, these are within the, the blood. And so the neutrophils are approximately 60% of the white blood cell count. Um, they are identified by the lobulated nuclei, and these are really active uh, in bacterial infection. Okay, they're the most common type. They're approximately sixty percent. The next is a lymphocyte, and we can see the lymphocyte down here. It's it's at thirty percent, and it is going to be uh, involved in. Uh, it originates in the bone marrow, but it um, goes to the lymphatic tissue where it is going to um, also uh, differentiate into different types of uh, lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes. So that's 30%. Monocytes are the next. They are at 6%. And they produce uh, uh, macrophages when they leave the circulation. So monocytes become macrophages. Okay, remember that, monocytes, macrophages. Eosinophils are going to be the red uh, cells and binu uh, bilobular, and these are involved in allergies, so they release antihistamines. So they're also involved in parasitic infections. So eosinophils uh, are going to be increased when there's allergic reaction. And last but not least, the lonely basophil, about 1%, uh, which we see here is going to be uh, bluer and is going to be uh, evident in inflammation. Okay, so if you remember this mnemonic and remember 60, 30, 6, 3, 1. So 60, 30, 6, 3, so rule of 6, 3, 6, 3, 1. Uh, you can remember the uh, order of, of uh, white blood cells. Okay, so let's look at the endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Okay. <clears throat> So glands are formed from the downgrowth of uh, epithelial sheet. Uh, during embryogenesis, most of the glands develop with epithelial cells going downward uh, from the sheet and underlying connective tissue. These glands can be classified as exocrine glands or endocrine glands. Exocrine glands retain the connection with the epithelium uh, and at, at the free surface, and at the piece that connects to the free surface is typically the duct, and the secretory cells are going to be at the end of the duct, which are contiguous with uh, the duct, okay? So we can see this in a more um, 
mature, we can see the secretory region and the duct region uh, opening up into the lumen, okay? Where in an endocrine, it loses its connection with the surface. Uh, there is no duct and the secretory cells uh, secrete into the surrounding tissue and usually uh, go through the basilar part of the cell and empty into the blood vessels, okay? So their secretory products like hormones are picked up by the, the nearby um, um, blood vessels. So exocrine glands, um, uh, examples are sweat glands, okay? endocrine glands, uh, a good example is the pancreas for the insulin, okay, and um, testosterone is another hormone, okay, so exocrine, endocrine. Okay, so if we see a few types here, unicellular glands are included uh, in goblet cells in the trachea. And we can see these single glands here called mucus cells, which are going to be in the pseudostratified uh, epithelium of the trachea. And we can see the, the little brush border there, and we can see that here. Um, and we see the goblet cells right here. So that's a unicellular gland. Um, in the left image, we see uh, simple epithelial glands, which are the sweat glands. So we can see cross sections of that. And then to the right, we can see an image of simple branch tubular glands, which we find in the duodenum. We can see those here, okay? All right. Also wanted to point out the difference in mirocrine, which is also ecrine, apocrine and holocrine. Uh, those secretions, uh, there are three types. The first is the mirocrine, which is definitely the most common. And we see in sweat glands and salivary glands. So in the mirocrine glands, only the secretory product is released from the cell. So we see it uh, being um, created in the Golgi complex, the vesicles go to the surface, and then through exocytosis, they're released into the lumen, okay? So apocrine cells, uh, their claim to fame is some or part of the cell is lost along with the secretory product. So here, the like in the mammary gland, the um, uh, the droplets, uh, lipid droplets are forming in the cytoplasm and then part of that cell is then broken off with the um, um, membrane covering it. Um, so you're losing part of the cell when the product is secreted. So these are definitely in mammary glands. Um, they're also in sweat glands in the armpit groin and areas around the nipples and Think of those as the scent glands because the secretions of these usually have an odor to it. And if you think about your armpit, um, you know that that usually has a, a scent to it. And that is part of the apocrine system. The last one, which is the least common, is holocrine. And this uh, releases its product by uh, the mature cell dying and releasing its secretory product. Um, and so that cell is totally lost. So these are the least common and are seen in sebaceous glands of the skin and mybobian glands of the eyelid. Okay. All right. Well, we doing good here on time? A little over, but um, I think okay. you could spend like about five minutes or so on okay. the embryology. Okay. That's so, um, the, what I wanted to talk about was gestational or menstrual age versus fertilization or conceptual age. Um, the uh, gestational or menstrual age is calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period, where fertilization or conceptual age is going to begin at fertilization. And so we can see here that um, the if you're trying to find out what the date of start of the last menses was. If the last mensi was 10 weeks ago, how old is the fetus now? And that would be eight weeks. So, and that's the conceptual age. 
And when we look at embryology, we want to look at the different stages, the embryonic stage from weeks five to 10, and then the fetal stage from 11 to 40. And we want to note that during different parts of these stages, different parts uh, uh, or systems are more susceptible to teratogens or things that could infect the body. Um, most notably, initially is going to be the central nervous system and heart, and we just talked about those. So we see that a teratogen is any substance that interferes with fetal development uh, or cause an increase in congenital disabilities. And again, we can see through here where the um, different uh, systems are going to be uh, affected by teratogens. Um, early on, it's going to be the nervous system in the heart, followed by eyes, and you can see the chart there. And so when we think about examples of teratogens, we think about alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome, viral infections like Zika virus, uh, cigarette smoking, which we know is not good for the baby, and also some drugs and prescribed medications. So we can see at different parts of gestation that uh, certain systems are going to be more susceptible to these teratogens. The menstrual cycle is uh, split into follicular phase and luteal, luteal phase. The menstruation is going to be uh, the shedding of the intermetrial lining, and the, then the um, ovum is, is, or the oocyte is going to start forming. We see an elevation of estrogen, and at about week four or day fourteen, we see the spike of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone from pituitary, which is going to cause ovulation. And those spikes are going to come back down. Progesterone is going to go up as the corpus luteum is uh, providing progesterone to fortify the endometrial lining. Okay, remember that the ovum survives 12 to 24 hours uh, in during um, fertilization, and it should be um, fertilized in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Okay, and the Embryo uh, implants into the endometrium, and remember that the blastocyst begins to differentiate in the embryoblast and the trophoblast, uh, the trophoblast being around, the embryoblast uh, being the inner cell mass, and we have the amniotic cavity. In the middle of the second week, the embryoblast and trophoblast begin to differentiate. The embryoblast uh, differentiate differentiates into epiblasts and hypoblasts, you can see here, and then the trophoblast is going to be around, um, and that's going to further divide into syncytio and cytotrophoblast. So try cytotrophoblast, the syncytotrophoblast, okay? And process of gastrulation is going to create a three-layer um, of, of from a two layer, so from blastulation to gastrulation. And we know that the primitive node and primitive streak, uh, which is going to form the caudal to cranial uh, axis of the um, embryo. And we see that at the primitive streak, the, the uh, epiblast cells start to go into and underneath and form first the endoderm of and then the second wave of cells are going to form the mesoderm and the layer that stays out in the outside uh, that was the last or remaining part of the epiblast becomes the ectoderm and that creates the trilaminar disc. Okay, And so those three layers are going to develop into different structures and I'll go to the last slide here. So the mesoderm specifically is going to develop on either side of the, noto, uh, the neural tube and notochord. The periaxial uh, mesoderm is going to form the um, part of the head and the vertebral column and the muscles around it. The, um, the intermediate mesoderm is going to uh, create the kidneys and gonads and the lateral plate mesoderm is going to give you both the body wall and the upper lower extremities and the um, smooth muscle layers in the intestinal organs. Okay, so 
Thank you, Dr. Frank. That was awesome. That's such a good overview of what we had done before and, and good getting into the next stuff. I know it's a lot to cover all that material yep. in 30 minutes. So and we can take the first five minutes to to go over some yeah. um, introductory stuff. So no problem. Um, we got some some good questions in here. And I did realize that on our YouTube channel, the comments are not going through um, or being shared. So sometimes when we answer a question in the chat, it hasn't always made it to video. So I'm just going to read through a couple of the ones that have been answered, and then I'll help um, direct the questions that have not been to Dr. Frank. So one question is, what is contraindicated? Uh, and another student actually chimed in and correctly, you know, identified that uh, it means the treatment should not be performed based on uh, sort of this patient situation. So the opposite of saying indicated means that the treatment is warranted for something contraindicated is then saying the opposite based on this patient situation, whether it be pregnancy, for example, is going to indicate that you should not um, do that treatment or, you know, drug. Um, another student asked, what is an umbilical vesicle? And uh, Dr. Peterson uh, let the student know that it's another name for a yolk sac. Um, I see a question that didn't get an answer quite yet. Uh, so Dr. Frank, is there any hemopoiesis in the placenta? Not that I recall. Dr. Peterson, can you back no, me up on? The placenta is just where gases and nutrients are going to be exchanged. It just is that location within the endometrial wall where the maternal blood supply and the fetal blood supply are in really close proximity. But again, remember, they should never mix. So it's just the movement of gas molecules and nutrient molecules across uh, a very uh, confined space. Um, so we also have another question uh, that was, how do holocrine, holocrine glands kill themselves to secrete like that? Is it a special form of apoptosis? And uh, Dr. Peterson told this person, you're absolutely spot on, you're correct. Uh, a question about neurons um, being classified with miracrine cells. And uh, we clarified that uh, the classifications that Dr. Frank mentioned were used for exocrine glands only. Um, and then another really good question is what's causing the luteinizing hormone spike for ovulation? Uh, Dr. Peterson um, covered um, <laughs> uh, increasing concentration of SFH uh, is going to trigger then the LH surge. Um, and then let's see, we've got another question I can see here that hasn't been answered. Um, and let's have Kathy go first. She's got her hand raised. Kathy, can you unmute yourself and ask your question to Dr. Frank? Uh, yes, actually, sorry. Uh, I had a question on the uh, on the yolk sac. So I know there's like two yolk sacs at some point, and we hear like a lot about like on the post posterior wall of the yolk sac, this will happen, or these cells will migrate here. But like, if that's the umbilical vesicle, what, um, I guess, is that like completely surround the embryo at some point? Or is that only like part of the embryo growing with the other parts and then sort of wrapping around it? Like, uh, how does that actually develop after that picture we see where there's the uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and then like that uh, yolk sac, which I guess is probably the ectoderm, but, but yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give a little bit and then Dr. Peterson can back me up on this, but when the um, first wave of, of cells are coming in to create the, um, the uh, endoderm, you still have the hypoblast cells. And so they're actually deep to the uh, endoderm. And that is going to be uh, what is part of the yolk sac. And there's a primary yolk sac and then a secondary yolk sac. Um, and if you're talking about the, the primordial germ cells that uh, are part of that first wave that come in uh, through the, the um, the streak, the primitive streak, um, <clears throat> they're going to go into the hypoblast cells and kind of hang out for a while. Um, and then eventually they're going to uh, migrate basically into the end of intermediate mesoderm. Uh, and that is going to uh, be uh, what creates the, uh, that's what's going into the gonads. So Dr. Peterson, did I Right. And just quickly, you're right. 
There are two um, yolk sacs that form. The first one regresses very early on, and it's the secondary yolk sac or secondary umbilical vesicle that actually is present floating around with the embryo in the amniotic sac. And over time with embryonic folding, it the, the, the connection with the embryo to the yolk sac gets narrow and narrow and narrower and eventually gets retracted back into the embryo's body and the yolk sac gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then poop goes away by about the fetal period or about at eight weeks. So great question. Uh, very quickly, what is the difference between an epiblasts and hypoblasts? I think we really just almost answered that. In the bilaminar disc, there's the epiblast, and that will become everything that is associated with the embryo. And the hypoblast is really what is going to become or give rise to um, the structure we were just talking about, which is the yolk sac. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Awesome presentation. Yeah. Really appreciate it. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get our next uh, presenter uh, introduced to all of you. So Dr. Elise Oriana is our next presenter. Uh, she's going to be presenting on the musculoskeletal system. She is an assistant professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular and Cellular Biology. She received her doctorate in anatomy from the Pennsylvania State University at the College of Medicine. That's actually where I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Oriana, where she was the senior graduate student in a lab that I was rotating in. So she personally has helped train me and educate me in things. And I can tell you firsthand that she is amazing and you're really in uh, for a treat for the next 30 minutes or so. So uh, Dr. Oriana is the co-director of Medical Gross Anatomy and teaches medical special masters and biochemistry graduate students. She has interest in using technology to aid learning and is developing a dissection video series in an anatomy mobile app. Uh, her research interests lie in student retention of knowledge over time, specifically for anatomy coursework. So without further ado, let's learn from Dr. Oriana. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. I hope I can live up to it, much like Dr. Frank said. Um, I'm Dr. Oriana. I'm so excited to be here with you. This is so cool what all of you are doing. So I'm just like really pumped to be a part of it. So we're going to just jump right into it. Dr. So, Oriana, can you switch your presenter view? Oh, no. Did I switch it to the wrong one? Let's see. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. I did it backwards. <laughs> okay. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is the musculoskeletal system, specifically the anatomy, the embryology, and the histology of this system. So you might notice that some of these learning objectives are familiar. This is a good thing. Review, review, review. This is what's going to help us remember long term what we're talking about. But also for some of the stuff we've already covered, I might breeze through it a little quickly just so we can make sure we get through all of the content. But the information is on the slides for you when you come back and you watch the videos for review, so no worries. Let's start with our vertebral column. So you learned already a little bit about the vertebral column and its different regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral from superior to inferior. And it turns out that the vertebral column, besides being segmented this way, also has these curvatures. They can even either be a lordosis, which is a concave curvature when you're looking from the posterior view, or it can be kyphosis, which is more of a convex curvature from the posterior view. And the way I like to remember what has kyphosis, what has lordosis, is the lumbar region has lordosis. So both of them have L. And you might notice that the vertebra are segmented in such a way that it goes in a pattern, lordosis, then kyphosis, then lordosis, then kyphosis. So if I know that lumbar is lordosis, I can figure out through that pattern what the other regions are. So that's gonna help me remember it. Now, this is how we would typically expect the vertebral column to curve. You can have excessive lordosis or excessive kyphosis where it's just a little too curved. And then you can also have this situation here called scoliosis, where our vertebral column, instead of being kind of straight up and down, it actually is starting to curve medially and laterally, which we shouldn't typically expect. 
So we're going to move into a little bit of some MSK specializations here. So this might be some review for you. So we want to talk about a few of the differences in some of these structures. So tendons and ligaments. Tendons are muscle to bone. So we can think of the Achilles tendon. We've all heard of that probably. So we have these muscles that actually attach to bone through this tendon. So the Achilles tendon is a muscle to bone connection. We also have ligaments, which are bone to bone. So we've heard of the ACL, especially if we like sports, right? Anterior collateral ligament, the ACL, that's bone to bone. We also have this interesting, all these layers of fascia, which is just this really fun word we use for like almost everything. But fascia, we have superficial and deep. So the superficial is literally just below the skin. Mostly, most of the time, it's just like adipose tissue and connective tissue. Um, and then deeper to that, typically around our muscles, we have this deep fascia. And so we sometimes call it investing fascia because it's investing the muscles. And that really helps call, uh, create compartment compartmentalization of the muscles. Very helpful for us when learning MSK. And last, but certainly not least, we have aponeuroses. So aponeuroses are these broad attachments of either one or more muscles. And a lot of times we're gonna see more than one muscle come to an aponeurosis. So you have learned about the external oblique muscle here of the abdomen before. It has an aponeurosis. So you can see the external oblique muscle, the muscle fibers kind of fall away and we're left with this broad, flat sheet of fascia. So that's the external oblique aponeurosis. And we can take it one step further and see that that aponeurosis of the external oblique actually joins with the aponeurosis of internal oblique and transverse abdominis to actually create this rectus sheath that we see here, superficial to our rectus abdominis muscles. So those are aponeuroses. I know we're moving fast, but once again, you can come back and you can take it at your own speed whenever you'd like. Okay. Moving into joints. So the glenohumeral joint, this is our shoulder joint, okay? It is a ball and socket type joint. So the socket part is the glenoid cavity of the scapula. So you can see that here in this anterior view. You can, oh, sorry, posterior view. You can also see it here in the lateral view. That's our glenoid cavity there. And the ball of our ball and socket is the head of the humerus. So the head of the humerus is going to sit into that uh, glenoid cavity, and it's going to get stabilized just a little bit by this glenoid labrum. And this is going to help to deepen the joint. We can see how, um, uh, how not deep this joint is, how shallow this joint is. And that's going to give us a lot of flexibility, but what it ends up giving us is not a lot of stability. So we want to add stability. How else are we going to add stability? We're going to add some ligaments. So the ligaments that are gonna help add to this stability are the glenohumeral ligaments and they're named exactly how they attach. So from that glenoid labrum to that neck of the humerus, glenohumeral. We also have the coracohumeral from the coracoid process to the humerus. And the transverse humeral, which is kind of fun because it actually sits over this little sulcus here that the biceps brachii tendon passes through. So it's actually gonna help hold that little biceps brachii tendon and keep it stable. And we have another really fun ligament here, the coracoacromial ligament, which is super fun because it is actually only from scapula to scapula here. So from the coracoid process, which is a more anterior structure, to the acromion, which is a more posterior structure of our scapula. And that's just gonna help create some stability superiorly. So we have all these ligaments and we have muscles anteriorly and posteriorly and superiorly, but we don't really have any inferiorly. So our joint there tends to be at its weakest point inferiorly because of that um, association of the ligaments and muscles. But once again, what we wanna take away from this is stability and flexibility are trade-offs. If I'm gonna be more flexible, I'm gonna be a little less stable. So I'm gonna need help there. Moving on to our wrist joint, AKA our radiocarpal joint, named as such because it's a joint between our radius and our carpals. So we have the radius and ulna of our forearm. And in our wrist, we have those carpals. And then in our hand, we have those metacarpals and those phalanges. 
Turns out the ulna is not technically part of our wrist joint. It's just between the radius and the carpals, but there is a cute little um, articular disc here that sits there. And there's definitely ligaments that are gonna connect these bones. So what are those ligaments? So there's a lot of ligaments here, but we really only wanna focus on the ones that are for that radiocarpal joint. So between the radius and the carpals. So here we've got the dorsal and palmar radiocarpal ligaments. Now this is a dorsal view. So we're only seeing the dorsal part, but there is a palmar part as well. So we have this dorsal radiocarpal ligament between the radius and the carpal, surprise. We have the palmar ulnocarpal ligaments, which we can see between the ulna and the carpals. And mind you, I took a little bit of artistic liberty here because it's kind of hard to see the ulnar carpal ligament, but just remember between the ulna and the carpals. And we have a couple of collateral ligaments. So we have the radial collateral and ulnar collateral, and they're sitting at the most medial and most lateral aspects of this joint. So for the ulnar collateral ligament, it's gonna between, be between the ulna and the carpals, and for radial collateral between the radial and the carpals. And just remember, those are gonna be the furthest out medially and laterally. Okay, how are we feeling? Feeling strong? It's a lot, I know. But review, 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 you got it. I know you got it. Knee joints. So the knee joint is going to be between the tibia and the uh, femur. And so the thing about the tibia and the femur is that the fibula, which we know is another bone of our lower limb, not part of the joint again. So kind of similar to the wrist, but we will have ligaments that attach. Now, what we want to remember is we have these cute little condyles. These are these smoothened portions of bone where two bones are going to interact with one another. Okay. Nice and smooth. And then laterally to that, you have these epicondyles outside of that. We also have our cute little patella, which is a sesamoid bone. This is anterior to the joint. And a sesamoid bone is just going to be a bone that kind of gets invested in either tendon or muscle. And then the other part of this, before we get to the ligaments, are the menisci. So we have these really great menisci here, which are these C-shaped cartilages. And what they can do is they can help compensate for the change in shape of our femur. Because the femur is very round posteriorly, but as you get anteriorly, it gets quite flat. And so those menisci can help to compensate for that change in shape and also help with compression, right? If we're jumping up and down, our knees won't get injured because we have that nice cushy menisci there to help us. Okay, so that's kind of the cartilaginous and the bony parts of that joint. So we're gonna jump on into our ligaments and, oh yeah, we have medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus, one on each side. So we're gonna jump into our ligaments and what we're gonna see here is we do have a patellar ligament. So that patellar ligament is going to be between the patella and the tibia here. Fun fact, the patellar ligament often gets called a patellar tendon because it's continuous with the quadriceps tendon. So the quadriceps muscle attaches to the patella here. And so this is actually a continuous structure. Wars have been fought and won and lost over whether this is a patellar tendon or a patellar ligament. I am not here to solve that debate. But since we're talking about ligaments, we're calling it the patellar ligament. Nobody come for me, okay? All right, besides the patellar ligament, we have collateral ligaments and cruciate ligaments. So for our collateral ligaments, we're gonna have a medial collateral ligament, okay? Or a tibial collateral ligament. And the thing about that guy is that he's attached to the medial meniscus which means there's a little less flexibility there, a little less wiggle room there. So it's more prone to injury. If something happens to the meniscus, the medial collateral ligaments might get messed up. If something happens to the ligament, then the meniscus might get messed up. So they're kind of in it together. We also have the lateral collateral ligament, which is going to attach to the fibula. So the fibula is getting a ligament, but it's not part of the bony part of the joint, okay? And that lateral or fibular collateral ligament actually has a tendon of a muscle called the popliteus muscle that's gonna pass between it and the lateral meniscus. So a little less prone to injury there, okay? A little more wiggle room. Now we have the cruciate ligaments and they're called cruciate because they cross, okay? So the cruciate ligaments, we have the anterior cruciate ligament, which sits more anterior in its attachment to the tibia. Okay, the posterior cruciate ligament sits more posterior in its attachment to the tibia. 
And when I think about what their function is, I want to think about the anterior cruciate ligament preventing anterior displacement of that tibia. Okay. You, some people will think about it in reference to the femur, and that is all correct. When I when you when I first learn it, I prefer to use the tibia as my thinking spot because everything gets backwards when you think about it as attachments to the femur. So start with its attachments to the tibia and its functions on the tibia, and then graduate to thinking about its uh, attachments and function on the femur. Trust me, you'll have a better time. Okay, so that's our knee chugging along. We also have an ankle joint. So the ankle joint is another hinge joint um, and it has three points of articulation. We have our fibula, our tibia and our talus. So the talus is this bone here of our foot um, and ankle joint. And it has a couple of ligaments, a lateral ligament of the ankle, which is really composed of several smaller ligaments. We have an anterior talofibular, so it's in the name between the fibula and the talus, and it's anterior. We have a posterior talofibular, right? Uh, talus, fibula, it's posterior. And we have a calcaneofibular. And so this is between the fibula and the calcaneus, which is your heel bone. So you bang the heel of your foot down on the ground, that's your calcaneus. So that's our lateral ligament of the ankle. And then we have a medial ligament of the ankle, which is also called the deltoid ligament because it's composed of four smaller ligaments, which much of the time when you're first learning anatomy, we simplify to just deltoid. And then once you go further, um, if you have greater interest, then we will, uh, you'll talk about the individual ligaments, but we'll leave it as the medial deltoid ligament for now. Okay, now, Moving on to muscles. So we're jumping from joints to muscles. And you learned a lot already about the muscles of the back. You learned about things like the rhomboids. And the thing about that is, is that much of the muscles of the back are actually muscles or that are located in the back are muscles that actually move our upper limb or help in respiration. So they don't actually act on the vertebra of the back itself. So we are gonna talk about muscles that actually act on the vertebra themselves. And the big money maker here is gonna be the erector spinae. So the erector spinae, which are actually composed of three individual muscles themselves, are going to act to extend the vertebral column. So if I'm bent over and then I become erect again, that's extension. And they're very important for stabilization of the back muscles. So the thing about this is, these muscles were never really meant to help us lift heavy things. They're not particularly strong in that way. They're more for stability, which is why people tell you to lift with your legs, because if you try to only use those little back muscles to extend, guess what? You might injure yourself. So that's our erector spinae, and those are really what we want to take home from this particular slide, how important those guys are. Okay. Now, moving on to muscles of the neck, I will take a moment to talk about the sternocleidomastoid muscle of the neck because it is my favorite muscle because it is the best muscle in the body. And it's going to originate here um, on the manubrium and the clavicle, and it's going to insert on the mastoid process, which means that we have, because we have two of them, one on each side, if I'm going to use them at the same time, I'm just going to flex my neck here, just a little bit of flexion. But if I'm only going to use one, then I cause a rotation to the opposite side. So if I'm using my right sternocleidomastoid, my head is going to rotate to the left. Okay, and It's also going to help me flex. So I'm going to get rotation to the opposite side, flexion to the same side. And I like to call it the how you doing muscle. So you go, how you doing, right? That's sternocleidomastoid. That's the movement you're thinking of, okay? All right, so favorite muscle, sternocleidomastoid. Now, some of the muscles that are in the posterior aspect of the neck were in the previous slide, those splenius muscles. Um, and so those muscles are gonna help to extend the neck much like the erector spinae do, right? So we're just, if my neck is flexed because of my sternocleidomastoid, those splenius are gonna help then to bring it back to normal. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at muscles of the chest. So I know you got some of this before, so we're gonna breeze through because I know that you have seen these muscles before. We have the pectoralis major, and we know it's going to originate here from the clavicle and the sternum, and it's gonna insert on the anterior humerus. And so I wanna bring my insertion 
towards my origin. And that's how muscles are gonna work. So when I do that, I'm going to get adduction. That means I'm going to bring my humerus or my arm closer to my body. We'll also get some of these other um, actions, rotation and flexion of the arm, but adduction, that's a big one there. Okay? We have the pectoralis minor. So if I reflect this muscle just deep to pec major, we're gonna find pec minor. It's gonna originate from the ribs and it's going to insert on the coracoid process of the scapula. Coracoid process gets a lot of action, okay? And its action is going to be to protract the scapula, meaning that scapula is gonna be pulled anteriorly just a bit, okay? Similarly, we have another muscle that does a very similar action. This is the serratus anterior. Now, fun thing about serratus anterior, as we can see, we see it really well laterally, even though it's named anterior, and that's because we have a serratus posterior muscles as well, okay? Those are muscles of the back, but they're extrinsic. They help more in uh, respiration than anything else. So this serratus anterior muscle is going to originate from the ribs again and insert on the anterior aspect of the medial border of the scapula, again, helping to protract it. So you're pulling it anteriorly, and we can also think about uh, it actually holding the scapula against the body wall, okay, and keeping it nice and uh, taut against the body wall. Okay, muscles of the abdomen. Again, I know you've seen this in previous review sessions, so we won't take too much time with it, but there's a few things we want to hammer home. So the rectus abdominis is a bilateral muscle. We know that it goes straight down the middle here, but there are two sides, just like all the other muscles that we talked about today. And the, rec the rectus abdominis is gonna originate from the region of the pelvis, sorry, region of the pelvis, and it's going to insert on the sternum. So it's gonna help to flex the trunk. So flexion meaning I'm just gonna bend forward a bit. Here we have a cute little cross section here. Um, and I like to see that rectus abdominis on either side. We have the external oblique muscle, the most superficial of our oblique muscles, originating from some ribs and inserting on the linea alba. And the linea alba is a line that we draw right down the center of the abdomen, where those aponeuroses, remember aponeuroses? Where those aponeuroses of the external, internal, and uh, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis are going to come together. So those aponeuroses come together and we have this one line called the linea alba right down the center there. That's where it would be here, okay? Now the internal oblique is going to originate from thoracolumbar fascia and some of the pelvis, and it's also gonna insert on the linea alba. Remember, all those aponeuroses are coming together, okay? Right at the center of the body there. And then the transversus abdominis is the deepest layer, and I can appreciate this here in this cross section that most superficial is external oblique, just deep to that is internal oblique, and the deepest layer is the transversus abdominis. Again, our insertion on the linea alba, so all those aponeuroses are coming together to insert together. And because we have similar insertion, we do have similar actions. So these muscles are really all working together to compress the abdomen and support the abdominal viscera. We get a little flexion of the trunk, we get a little bit of rotation of the trunk there, but very, very important for um, maintaining that uh, support of the abdominal viscera. Okay, that's the muscles of our abdomen. Embryology. This is where we're gonna have fun. This is where it's gonna get a little less familiar, all right? So let's start here. We remember you have that flat layer of cells. Well, at this point, they have folded, okay, and creating this tube here, tube within a tube within a tube here. And this should look familiar. You have your neural tube, most dorsally. You have a cute little notochord just anterior to that. And on either side, you have paraxial mesoderm on either side of the neural tube, and then lateral plate mesoderm on either side of that. So that should be familiar from previous sessions. And what we want to think about with that paraxial mesoderm is you're going to get mesenchymal cells coming from that mesoderm. All that means is that mesoderm is going to give off some cells, some cells of it are going to proliferate, and those cells have the ability to become a variety of things. Maybe they'll become skeleton, maybe they'll become bone, I mean, maybe they'll become muscle, okay? It just, it has potential. Those mesenchymal cells have potential, okay? So those will come back a little bit later. 
So now we're a little bit further along in our development. And from that paraxial mesoderm, we have that paraxial mesoderm actually aggregating on either side of the neural tube into these little blocks called somites. So that paraxial mesoderm has aggregated into these blocks of tissue called somites on either side of that neural tube. And from here, I think it would be helpful to change our view. So we're going to look a bit longitudinally now and take a little bit of a better look at that neural tube. Okay, so now there's our neural tube. And anterior to that, we have our notochord, or ventral to that, we have our notochord. Okay, and on either side, we said that paraxial mesoderm is going to become these little blocks of somites. Okay, now from that point, we're going to get some um, specialization of these uh, cells or some differentiation of these cells. They're going to decide what they want to become. So these somites are going to uh, separate out into the dermomyotome, which is going to give off skeletal muscles and skin, or the sclerotome, which is going to help form vertebrae or ribs. Okay? And so what is going to happen is that the sclerotome is going to start to migrate and condense around the notochord. Now, I know I only have arrows on one side. This absolutely happens on both sides. It's just prettier for the picture to do it on one side, okay? So we're gonna condense that sclerotome and we're gonna end up condensing into what's going to be the future vertebral bodies, okay? So we're going to then, that sclerotome is gonna become the vertebra and that dermomyotome actually does have regions to it. There's a dermatome portion and a myotome portion. The dermatome is gonna become the skin of the back and the dermis, and the myotome is going to become skeletal muscle. Now, again, I took some artistic liberty here. It's more complicated than this, but for the most part, that's the gist of it, okay? Now, we started with this very simple drawing, and we've now differentiated into all these layers. I have my somite with my dermatome, my myotome, and my sclerotome. Everything's migrating. And what we want to remember as we move forward is that what is going to become the limbs, the bone and the muscle of the limbs, we're going to get a migration from that paraxial mesoderm, okay, towards the lateral plate mesoderm. And it's together, that is what's going to be the precursors to the limbs and the limb butts, okay? So as all of this is happening, all of this is going down, okay, wild sauce, there's even more happening, okay? And what's happening is we're actually going to get spinal nerves beginning to form, okay? So a bit of a combination of the neural tube and neural crest cells, okay, are gonna start forming the spinal nerves much in the same kind of segmenting pattern that the sclerotome did to form those vertebrae, those future vertebrae, okay? So we're gonna to get to this boom, boom, boom. Each little segment is gonna get a spinal nerve. And what ends up happening is in the adult, we can see that segmentation, right? These uh, vertebra, right? We have those cervical vertebra and each cervical vertebra in between, you're gonna have a cervical nerve, same for thoracic, right? So all these spinal nerves, all the way down our vertebral column, it's very segmented. And it's because of the way this forms, okay? And as we look in the adult um, human, we can see those segments of nerves are maintained and we call these the dermatomes, the innervation of the skin of each of these segments that developed. Now, as you learn more about different nerves, we're gonna give them all cute little names, right? You're gonna have genitofemoral nerve, iliohypogastric nerve, but at the end of the day, they are just spinal nerve levels, T10, T11, T12, okay? So with all that bared in mind, we think about the limb rotation. So you already learned about limb development. You learned about the limbs being developed from that apical ectodermal ridge, right? And you want to remember that all of that mesoderm, some of the paraxial mesoderm, the lateral plate mesoderm, that ectoderm from that apical ectodermal ridge are all going to come together to start forming that limb bud. It's going to get pulled out together. And those nerves are also going to get pulled out, right? In that segmental pattern, here's those limb buds forming. This is actually a mouse, super cute. But we wanna think about the way these limb buds are forming, those dermatomal levels, those segments of innervation are also being dragged along with that, um, with that development, okay? 
And it turns out when you're a cute little embryo, look how cute you were, okay? You were adorable. This is your baby picture. Your limbs were kind of pointing out like this, right? And this is how the limbs are, very pointed anteriorly. But in order for us to become what we are now, we have to get rotation of the limbs. And so the upper limb is going to rotate laterally about 90 degrees, the lower limb immediately uh, about 90 degrees. And what's gonna happen is because of that rotation, that nice pretty segmentation gets distorted. Think about like unwrapping a candy cane or wrapping a candy cane, right? If you rotate it, the spiral pattern is gonna happen. And so that uh, explains in part why in our thorax and our abdomen, it's nice and like, whoop, you have nice little lines, T10, T11, T12, and then in the limbs, it becomes more spirally. It's because of that rotation that we have the dermatomes looking that way. If you've ever wondered why on earth that would happen, that is why, segmentation and rotation. Okay, I hope you feel great about that and our brains are not on fire. <laughs> because we're going to talk a little about, a bit about histology, and then I promise I will leave you alone. So we're going to talk about chondrogenesis. So we are going to look at how cartilage is formed at the histological level or at the microanatomy level. So let's make some cartilage. Mesenchyme, remember that mesenchyme? Just cells that have potential, yes? So cells from the mesoderm with potential are going to proliferate, so they're going to multiply, and they're going to differentiate into cute little chondroblasts, okay? Now, these chondroblasts are going to start secreting matrix, and they're going, because they're secreting this matrix, imagine just like gel coming out of these chondroblasts, it's going to start pushing the chondroblasts apart, okay? And then as we move further along, the mesenchymal cells that are hanging out just next to, next to this developing matrix and chondrocytes, right? The, that, the, that layer of cells, that layer of mesenchyme right next to it is going to then differentiate into the perichondrium, right? Which is just the outer casing of the cartilage, right? So these chondroblasts are going to also be uh, differentiating at the same time or maturing at the same time into full-on chondrocytes, so the cells of our cartilage, okay? And what they end up looking like is, I think they look like little eyeballs or like, yeah, like little eyeballs, like the nucleus is the little, like the pupil, and then around it is a lacuna, so it's just a space around it, a little protective space around it um, that's like rather empty, okay? And that's a chondrocyte, and so that's what they look like, little eyeballs, okay? Now, once we've started this process, once we have some of the mature chondrocytes and matrix happening, uh, cartilage can grow in a couple of ways. One of the ways is interstitial growth, which means that within this matrix, right, of cartilage, the individual chondrocytes will undergo mitosis, new chondrocytes will form, they will secrete matrix, and everything will start pushing apart again. So we're going to get more growth of that cartilage. We also have appositional growth, which means that you're going to have mesenchymal cells from that perichondrium area that are going to differentiate into chondroblasts, which are then going to secrete cartilage, uh, a cartilage matrix, and it's going to actually cause the cartilage to grow from that surface. So you're either growing in the matrix or you're growing from the surface. Okay, so now we've made cartilage. Once we've made cartilage, we now have the scaffolding to make bone. So specifically hyaline cartilage is what that fetal skeleton is um, uh, made of, right? It's all this hyaline cartilage. And mesenchymal cells, right? Cells with potential from the mesoderm are gonna invade that hyaline skeletal model and they're gonna differentiate into osteoblasts, okay? Osteoblasts secrete osteoid, okay? So those osteoblasts are going to go to that center of that diaphysis, that developing diaphysis, and they're going to secrete their osteoid, um, and they're going to actually murder the chondrocytes, right? Remember, boop, chondrocytes. They are going to suffocate the chondrocytes, and all that's left are the lacuna. And then those osteoblasts can move right on into those lacuna and start doing their thing. They will uh, mature into osteocytes, which then starts secreting a matrix that then creates that bone, what will become that mature bone. Now, remember, chondrogenesis is ongoing, which means I'm not going to run out of hyaline cartilage at this point. The hyaline cartilage is being made through chondrogenesis, 
and then the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are moving in and then turning that hyaline cartilage into bone. So here, what's gonna happen is that those osteocytes, right, um, are going to be secreting that mo bone matrix. And then osteoclasts are actually gonna come down and start breaking down some of that new bone. Why would we do this? Well, if you think about what you learned about bone, the outside of a diaphysis of a bone is that nice, hard, lamellated bone, but inside it's spongy. So these osteoclasts are actually coming in, they're breaking down that center bit of bone, creating some space and actually making spongy bone through that process of eating up that newly formed bone. Eventually, you're actually gonna have this process happen all over again, but in the epiphyses. So we call these secondary ossification centers. Primary happened in the diathesis, secondary is gonna happen in the epiphysis. So we're gonna do this all again, and that's why we have spongy bone in the epiphyses of our bones, because those osteoclasts are coming in, breaking down that newly formed bone, okay? Now, eventually, we get this mature bone, and we can see how the adult has this uh, hyaline cartilage layer, right, at the epiphyseal plate. This is how we can have growth of bone, right? Your bones start off short, and because of this process of chondrogenesis making more hyaline cartilage, and osteogenesis, which then takes that hyaline cartilage and turns it into a lamellated bone or mature bone, we can elongate our bones throughout life, well, not throughout life, but until we're done maturing. So that's why we can have this, uh, can have this growth. And that's what that epiphyseal plate is. It's that leftover hyaline cartilage there to um, help your bones grow. Okay, so we talked all about that. And so now we can see in the adult, this histology or this microanatomy of the mature versus the immature bone. Now you saw this in previous sessions, you have that central osteon surrounded by that lamellated kind of concentric pattern of a uh, hard compact bone, okay? Again, found in the circumferences, right? In the outer parts of the diaphysis is where that hard bone is found. And that immature bone, we have it that we have it all throughout our fetal skeleton, obviously, because we're developing. But in adults, we can find it in a couple places, this kind of immature bone that doesn't have that nice lamellated appearance. Um, one of the places is tendons, where tendons attach to bone. So tendons and muscles act on bone, and they can actually cause changes in the bone because that portion of the bone has this potential to grow. So a lot of the big structures that you see coming off of bones and stuff, they have been created from the action of those muscles, okay? And then also for fun for funsies, the alveolar sockets of your oral cavity. So this is why we can do dental work throughout your life because this uh, potential bone, this immature bone is there and can kind of remodel when it needs to. Okay, last but certainly not least, we have skeletal muscle. So we just want to take a moment, you've seen skeletal muscle versus cardiac and smooth, but we just want to take a moment to hammer home some of the differences. So for the skeletal muscle, we can see how, uh, how its pattern is so organized. It's so organized and so uniform because of those sarcomeres that you learned about, right? And these nuclei, they're kind of in the periphery, kind of squished into the periphery. And so this nice organized uh, layers of sarcomeres are going to help that bone to contract and relax in a very controlled fashion right? Cardiac muscle, on the other hand, it's not nice and organized, same length of uh, myofibril, same everything, right? There's actually kind of jagged and it goes off in different directions and they might be different lengths, right? And that's because of these intercalated discs. You have these little intercalated discs connecting these muscle uh, cells to one another with these little centrally located nuclei. And the big important thing about this is they have gap junctions, which means ions can flow between these muscle fibers very easily. Similarly, that's with smooth muscle. Smooth muscle also has gap junctions, which means that you can get uniform, very quick contraction of these structures. So for the heart, right, you want your ventricles to contract all together. And one of the reasons they're able to do that is because the ions can move so quickly through the, um, 
through these muscle fibers. Okay? Um, another thing about the differences is the smooth muscle is very spindle shaped. So we can see how long at that central nucleus this smooth muscle is. This is really great for elasticity for tensile strength because our, especially like our intestines, they're going to be contracting and lengthening and contracting and lengthening as it's pushing food down the GI tract. So this is so important for that, that not only do you get this nice, um, even continuous uh, movement of ions and contraction of muscle, but also that it's maintaining this ability, uh, this tensile strength, this ability to maintain contraction over a long period of time. And so we're very grateful to that nice fusiform shape for that. Okay, that is the end of my presentation and we can get to any questions that we have. Dr. Oriana, I love that. I love your anecdotes and uh, get the images that you made, I think, clarify so much better than a lot of the textbook images can. So really appreciate your expertise with that. Um, while we wait for some more questions to come in, we've been trying to answer some in the chat for the sake of time. Uh, oh, we got one from, from Kathy. Go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll take some questions that haven't been answered since we're short on time. So for... Uh, for cases where there's less stress on a bone or, for instance, in space, do you have less woven bone at the tendon insertions? You wouldn't necessarily have less woven bone be at those tendon insertions. I would say you would have less lamellar bone there because the potential would still be there. But if you're not getting strong action at that point, then you may not create those nice bulges of bone or, or protrusions of bone that that muscle would create. So the potential should still be there. You shouldn't have less woven bone there. Okay, thank you. No, great question. All right, another question. Uh, yeah, okay. So for the um, for those cells in the heart that are using uh, like automaticity or where they're like, they're causing the heart to contract, um, do they, so they're shooting ions through those intercalated discs or is there a special mechanism which they use other than that? Um, and then what ions are they using for that? So it's not necessarily the, the like you're thinking of like the SA nodes, or the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node that are gonna have that autorhythmic ability. They can cause uh, depolarization on all on their own. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they're not necessarily the ones releasing the ions. Um, so they're gonna create, they're gonna start off that depolarization um, and then because of the way that the depolarized cell can then travel um, from cell to cell to cell, thanks to those gap junctions, then you end up getting the uh, the taking in or releasing of ions along that depolarization length. The, the ions are already there, right? Um, which is primarily sodium and potassium. Those are the big players there. They're already present. It's just the matter of, are you opening those channels to actually let those ions move. And that's what those SA nodes and AV nodes are allowing to happen in creating that autorhythmic um, uh, potential. Just gets pressing the on button. Okay. I don't know if anybody has a more particular answer to that, but that's how I think of it. Maybe just a follow up because I think the question was also about the actual contraction of the individual cardiac muscle cells. So, and you, you touched on it. So they're just sequestered and they're released as calcium ions out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So just kind of finishing the story and bringing it full circle at least. Okay, so that's pretty similar to skeletal muscle, right? Uh, contraction? It's very similar. It's very, very similar. The difference just being that the sarcoplasmic reticulum will differ between cardiac and skeletal muscle. Um, and most of that is just to create that continuous contraction and that contraction of the muscle all at the same time versus more segmentally, which is what happens in the skeletal muscle. There's also particular receptors in the muscles that are similar in both skeletal and cardiac with the mechanism that they undergo and how they interact with one another 
differs. Um, and this is coming from my PhD thesis that I did in muscle. So I would say that is beyond what you need to know for this exam. But good question. Awesome. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through and read the comments, um, but I can go through and try to comment those um, in the YouTube video uh, so that you still have access to those um, as well. So I will let Dr. Haggerty introduce our next speaker and round of applause for Dr. Oriana and her awesome uh, teaching. Yes, thank you, Drs. Uh, Frank and Oriana, and now Dr. Spiedek. You guys are tremendous. Um, this has been an agreement between us three anatomy co-founders that we were going to have faculty do these tutoring sessions, and I, I think that was a really great idea. This has been truly great. Um, so I am introducing our next speaker. I'm introducing Dr. Spiedek. Uh, she is with Thomas Jefferson University, uh, Sydney um, Kimmel Medical College, where I also work. Uh, she is our anatomy thread director at the SKMC. Uh, she has her a bachelor's in science and biology from Chestnut Hill College. Her PhD is in experimental teratology and developmental biology from Thomas Jefferson University. Her favorite part of anatomy is whatever she is teaching at the moment. And I can attest to that because I do watch her teach live sessions all the time. Um, and she's very enthusiastic every single time. Uh, when not teaching, she spends time uh, with her husband, Sean, and her beagles. Their names are Curly Fries and Moody Blue. And her hobbies include knitting and crocheting while watching crime shows on TV. Um, and I will just give a special shout out. Uh, Dr. Spudik is my uh, supervisor and mentor, Thomas Jefferson. So um, it's been a complete pleasure to work with her. And I'm so excited that she's able to do a presentation for us this week and next week. Um, so I really, you guys are in for a treat. So thank you, Dr. Spudik. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see? Okay, great. Um, so I have a, a number of different things that I am going over today. So um, this slide gives kind of all of the objectives that I was given for this review. Um, and I kind of reworked them into uh, kind of a different flow. Um, so this uh, uh, version two is kind of the flow that I'm going to go um, proceed through the materials, okay? So we're gonna start with our nervous system. Um, so the human brain is very complex, uh, as, as you all know. Um, I want you to understand that the human brain is um, set up and uh, in a number of extensive folds, okay? So we have our uh, gyri, um, which are our bulging areas. Um, we have our sulci, which are grooves. Occasionally we will come along a very deep groove um, and we call that a fissure, okay? So there's some vocabulary for, for you. Um, up here in this upper uh, right-hand image, we can see the human brain. This is a lateral view, okay? We'll see this a lot. And then this lower figure uh, we see the brain in a medial view. This is what we call a hemisected brain or a brain that has been cut um, in half uh, down the center, um, the longitudinal fissure. Uh, you'll often see here a little compass um, with arrows pointing up and down or left and right. And that's going to tell you um, what is superior and inferior, what is anterior and posterior. Okay, so we have um, some orientation there. The longest and deepest of the fissures is the longitudinal fissure. So you can see here in this upper uh, panel, um, it's highlighted in red. This basically splits the human brain into two separate hemispheres or two halves. Each half has its own job, okay? So um, in terms of sensory or motor, um, each half is going to control the opposite side of the body. So the left half, the left cerebral hemisphere is going to control the right side of the body and vice versa. So it's a little bit uh, confusing, um, but that, that is the way uh, we have evolved. Um, at the same time, the two halves really have to talk to one another. So uh, 
you can't have one half of your body doing something without the other half of your body knowing what's going on. So that communication happens between a giant band of white matter and white matter are large myelinated neuro neuronal axons that are passing between both of these hemispheres. Okay, so these contain um, information going from left to right and information going from right to left. They allow the two halves of your brain to communicate with each other. In addition to controlling the opposite sides of the body with respect to sensation and motor, there is also a very clear laterality to our um, hemispheres. I think everyone uh, probably on the call has uh, heard someone mention themselves as being left brain or right brain. Um, has anyone ever had a um, that taking a test to determine their their sidedness, their hemisphericity. Anyone? They're really they're really cool. Okay. Um, the I took one. I'm actually right down the middle. So, but I've seen people who are very left brain or very right brain. The left side of your brain is really uh, can be some summarized as detail, okay? So it is detail thought, analytical, rational thought. Um, most of our language centers are there. It's where we plan things. Um, it's where we are logical, okay? The right side is more intuitive, okay? It is emotional. It is adventurous. It is impulsive. It is our creative side. It runs our imagination. So people who tend to be more analytical are sometimes referred to as left-brained and other people who are more emotional and impulsive and intuitive are said to be right-brained. Okay. Now, each of the cerebral hemispheres is also subdivided into five functional lobes, okay? There's a frontal lobe and we can see that here. Um, there is a parietal lobe. I'm highlighting right here. Everyone can see my pointer, correct? My occipital lobe is right here. And my temporal lobe is down here, okay? This is on the lateral view. On the medial view, we can see again, portions of all of the four original lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. But we can also see this deep ring of cortical tissue, brain matter, which is the limbic lobe. It is only visible on the medial side and some people might fight you as to whether or not this is a real lobe or not. It is a lobe. It is also a system. I will, I will go to the mat on that every day of the week. Um, the limbic lobe is actually the oldest part of your brain evolutionarily, okay? It, is, it was the first part of the cortex. It houses your emotion and memory, but we'll get into that in a couple of minutes, okay? Each of the uh, functional lobes um, has to be delineated from the other lobes. And your brain does that by uh, using some very deep sulci, okay? They're named sulci. Um, so we have down here, if you follow my cursor, this is the central sulcus, okay? Whoops. Um, separating our frontal lobe from our parietal lobe. Then we have our lateral sulcus or sylvian fissure, separating our frontal and parietal from our temporal lobe. If we look at the medial surface, we can see two more sulci. We have a parieto-occipital sulcus, which is right here. 
And as the name implies, it separates our parietal and our occipital lobes, parietal here being in blue and occipital being in green. And then we have um, the cingulate sulcus, which wraps around the limbic lobe and the cingulate gyrus and separates that, that limbic lobe from all of the other lobes, okay? So we have our major uh, delineating uh, sulci. Okay, so um, let's go through what each lobe does. And, and I kind of took a little liberty here. Each, each of these um, has the lyrics to a song that exemplifies what that lobe does. So the frontal lobe is every move you make, every step you take, okay? So the frontal lobe is the action lobe. We have our primary motor cortex, which is just in front of, just anterior to our central sulcus. So it's called our precentral gyrus. This is our primary motor cortex. And this is where all voluntary motion is initiated. So every movement of my hand, all the movements of my lips and tongue and jaw, if you're walking down the street, that is where each, each muscle is fired from that primary motor cortex. Just in front of or anterior to it is our secondary motor cortex. And this is the planning of voluntary motion. You guys should know a little bit by now with all of the muscles in our body that each movement requires the sequential contraction or firing of a number of different muscles. And so that has to be planned. And so that planning is done in the secondary motor cortex. And then very all the way far out here in the, in the frontal pole of the brain is what we call the prefrontal cortex. And this is how we act. This is our personality. This is our behavior. These are the decisions that we make. This is our working memory, that random access memory um, that allows us to make very quick decisions um, uh, as we are moving through the day. This is all done in that prefrontal cortex, okay? Now we're gonna move to the temporal lobe, okay? Okay, and the lyric here is, do you hear what I hear? Okay, so the temporal lobe's primary um, cortex has to deal with hearing. So the primary auditory cortex is aligned in this upper superior temporal gyrus right along here, okay? It is the only uh, primary cortex that actually gets information from both sides of the body. So both ears will transmit information to both uh, primary auditory cortices and your brain uses the information from both ears to determine what side the noise is on. So it has to do with echolocation. Um, that processing of sound is in that secondary auditory cortex, and that is outside here on the lateral aspects of the temporal lobe. That secondary auditory cortex, in addition to processing sound location, is also processing pitch, loudness, um, the, the speed at which the sound is coming, um, all of those different aspects of, of hearing. We're gonna move to the occipital lobe now, okay? Um, and that has to do, as the lyric implies, with vision, okay? So we have the primary visual cortex, which is visible on the medial side of the occipital lobe. And it runs along this feature here called the calcarine sulcus. Now with respect to vision, each hemisphere, so the right hemisphere is dealing with the left visual field, not the left eye, but it's the left half of each eye. And the, and the left hemisphere is dealing with the right visual field which is the right half of what you're looking at for each eye. That's a little, little confusing, but it's not 
left and right eye, it's left and right visual field. That is handled in this primary visual cortex. The secondary visual cortex is again, positioned outside, kind of encircling this primary visual cortex. And that secondary visual cortex is going to um, handle things like brightness and color, um, movement of an object that we're, that you're watching, tracking, uh, is it coming closer to you? Is it going further away? Uh, all of that uh, information is being handled by that secondary visual cortex. The parietal lobe <clears throat> is for somatosensory information, okay? So somatosensory, sensory is, is information coming into the body and somato means body. So it's everything that is coming from your skin. Okay, so this is our somatosensory. It is housed in the postcentral gyrus, which is just behind our central sulcus. That is our primary somatosensory cortex. That is where all of the sensation from the body is initially brought into consciousness. It is felt, okay? That would be temperature, pain, vibration, pressure. All of that is somatosensory. That differs from the special sensory of hearing and olfaction and vision. So they are special sensory. These are somatosensory, okay? Just behind and below that primary sensory, somatosensory cortex is our secondary cortex. And this is where our sensation is being interpreted, okay? Um, how hot is it? How hard is something being pressed upon us? Is it, is it a burning pain? Is it a stabbing pain? Is it a um, achy pain? So that's the interpretation um, that we are doing here in that secondary sensory cortex. And then at the very back of the parietal lobe, here uh, where we are close to the junction of the occipital and the temporal is big area of integration, okay? So we are taking what we are seeing, we are taking what we are hearing, we are taking what we are feeling and we are putting it into context, okay? Um, we are, integrating all of this in order to effectively manage our response, which will happen in our frontal loop. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Okay. Now, the limbic lobe is about memories, memories and learning and the emotional connection that we have with our memories. We can see that that limbic lobe is very deep in our cerebral hemisphere. It wraps around the corpus callosum. It is the oldest um, portion of our brain evolutionarily. It has regions that are aligned with the frontal lobe, with the parietal lobe, with the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And it has communications with each of those regions because what it does is it's taking what we are doing, what we are touching, what we are tasting, what we are seeing, hearing, and smelling with how we are feeling at that moment to create a memory, okay? Now, the last thing I wanna talk about with respect to the cerebral hemispheres is um, the language centers, okay? So we actually have two language centers and most individuals have both of their language centers situated on the left hemisphere. There are a few people who are left-handed whose language centers are on, we've, we've known, we know from brain mapping, whose language centers are on the right side. But the majority of people, even left-handed people, have their language areas on the left side. We have one area called Broca's area. This is positioned in the frontal lobe and it is just, just next to the motor cortex for our vocal cords, our tongue, and our lips, and our jaw. So it controls the action of speaking. 
stroke damage that occurs in Broca's area leaves a patient unable to um, speak fluently. They speak haltingly, they can follow directions, uh, but they cannot repeat phrases very easily. So this is called a, a, uh, a, flu of a non-fluent um, aphasia. Um, aphasia means an inability to, to speak or use language. Uh, Wernicke's area, also on the left, is the, oops, sorry, is um, at the temporal lobe, and this is for language comprehension. So it's at the junction of the uh, temporal, occipital, and parietal lobe. It is for language comprehension. Damage here leads to nonsense speech um, and a complete loss of understanding. So this would be a fluent aphasia, okay? We're gonna move into the integumentary system um, now. Um, and I stole this from your earlier presentation on the skin. So this gives you the overview of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. And now we're gonna talk about some of the uh, receptors and structures that you find in the integument. So the sensory receptors, again, we just talked about information coming in from the skin. So we have some free nerve endings these end in the epidermis and um, they typically monitor for painful stimuli. We have Merkel's receptors. Um, these also are in the epidermis and these are for very fine detail, two point discrimination. We have Ruffini corpuscles, also called, as, also called bulbous corpuscles. These are in the dermis and they are um, stretch receptors. We have Meissner's corpuscles. Um, these are tactile corpuscles, and these are at the dermal epidermal junction, and these are for light touch, slow vibrations, and you find a lot of them in your fingertips. The Pacinian corpuscle is found deep in the dermis. It is also called the lamellar corpuscle. It is encapsulated, um, and it responds to deep pressures and fast vibrations. In terms of histology, the only two that you can really see uh, a lot of in a histological section from the skin are the Pacinian corpuscles and the Meissner's corpuscles. Um, Pacinian are deep in the dermis, the Meissner's are at the dermal epidermal junction. And if we zoom in, we can see that the Pacinian corpuscle looks like a sliced onion. Okay? It has a very, very distinct look to it. The Meissner's corpuscle is up in the dermal papilla and it has a kind of swirly look to it that I always equate with a, a fluorescent light bulb. I'll say the new fluorescent light bulbs, and it helps me remember that Meissner's corpuscles are for light touch. We also have sweat glands in our skin. So the eccrine sweat glands are found everywhere. They're positioned in the dermis and they are a single coiled tube. Um, and they're really for thermoregulation. So they are um, releasing a watery sec secretion. The apocrine sweat glands um, are also found in the skin, but in very specific locations like your armpits and your external genitalia. The apocrine sweat glands become active during puberty and they secrete a uh, protein and fatty liquid. Um, so it's got a lot of lipids in it. These are much larger glands. The proteins and fats tend to fester on your skin and that's what gives the smell to your armpits and your external genitalia. Histologically, the, this, on the um, left here, we can see eccrine glands. And then on the right, we can see apocrine glands. The eccrine glands, they're both coiled tubes, but the eccrine glands tend to be much smaller. The apocrine glands have very, very large lumens. Okay, They are pumping out a lot of stuff. Um, and so histologically, they are distinguishable through those um, characteristics. We also have hair follicles and sebaceous glands. The hair follicles are really epidermal extensions that go down into the dermis. They end with a, a root bulb and a papilla. That uh, papilla accepts a tiny little blood vessel and that is what allows the hair to keep um, growing. The bulb contains the matrix, which is the proliferative matrix um, and the pigment cells um, in there. 
The hair follicle is also associated with the erector pili muscle, which is a smooth muscle fiber that is attached to each hair follicle. Um, they contract involuntarily for thermoregulation, and it is these are what gives you goose pumps, goosebumps um, uh, when you get chilled. Associated with each hair follicle is a sebaceous gland. Um, sebaceous is a waxy, oily uh, substance called sebum, and it is secreted directly into the hair follicle uh, to lubricate um, the skin and hair in that area. Okay. Here we have the histology. We can see the uh, hair shaft coming down. We can see the bulb and the papilla. At the end, we can see a little tiny eccrine gland right here off to the left. Um, the erector pili muscle, we can see coming in right here to the hair shaft, and there is our sebaceous gland. They even look, even in histology, the sebaceous glands look kind of oily, in my opinion. They look kind of greasy. Okay. Um, we have some lymphatic system here. Uh, again, the lymph system is a uh, pulling. Uh, fluid from your interstitial tissues or the tissues, um, uh, the, the material between your cells, it's pulling that fluid out um, and anything that's in that fluid and it's passing these um, fluids through a number of lymph nodes. Okay, so we, you looked at the lymph node and the organization earlier, and let's just look at some major groupings. So the first one I wanna talk about um, not really lymph nodes, but they are tonsils and they are important. So they are, um, there's a group of lymphatic tissue that is arranged in a ring around your, the back of your throat. Um, it's protecting both your airways and your gut tubes. Um, we have some pharyngeal tonsils, which uh, you may hear called adenoids. We have tiny little tubal tonsils. We have palatine tonsils, which are the largest. These are um, tend to get infected a lot and what are removed during tonsillitis or tonsillectomy. And then we have some lingual tonsils on the back of the tongue. We have um, other nodes. Uh, we have a, a, a number of cervical lymph nodes, uh, some subdivisions that I, I think you should probably know are the submental, which is right underneath your chin. That's draining the lower lip and the tip of your tongue. So if anyone gets a tongue piercing, um, and it gets infected, that is where that infection is going to spread to. The submandibular uh, lymph nodes uh, drain the sides of your nose and your cheek. Um, so if you get a nose piercing and that gets infected, your submandibular nodes will get um, swollen. And then you have some deep cervical nodes. They're the ones that your mom's always check in when you have a sore throat. You know, everyone... Check, check your cervical nodes. Um, they are draining um, your nasal cavities, your scalp, your middle ear. So they will get inflamed with almost any cold that you have. Another major grouping is the axillary lymph nodes. These are draining, um, these are in, in kind of your armpit area. They're draining the upper limb, but they're also the major lymphatic uh, drainage pathway for breast tissue, okay? Um, uh, when breast cancer is um, moving or metastasizing, um, it is moving through the axillary lymph nodes in a very specific pattern, okay? Um, they are um, first through the pectoral nodes, then through the subscapular nodes, through the inf infl infraclavicular nodes, and then the apical nodes. And so breast cancer will actually be um, assessed by how many of these axillary lymph nodes have been involved in or, or, or contain metastatic tissue. The lower lymph nodes, um, the lower limb is drained um, by, a, of course, a number of um, lymphatic vessels. The two major groupings of nodes are the popliteal lymph nodes at the back of the knee and the inguinal lymph nodes that are up near the groin, which is where the, the thigh meets the trunk, okay? Um, these Inguinal nodes are in uh, superficial and deep uh, clusters, um, and they will often become uh, inflamed if there is an infection in the lower limb. Okay, um, let's try to. I know we're running. We're running late. Um, let's try to get through the embryology here. 
So we, we know uh, we looked at norulation earlier in other review sessions. So we have the neural tube is converging. Um, uh, the neural plate is converging to form the neural tube. Uh, that's going to close. Our neural crest cells are going to migrate out of the way and make all sorts uh, of contributions during development. Um, but sometimes the neural tube does not close all the way. And so if we have a complete, um, if we have a failure of the anterior neuro, neuro core to close, um, we have a condition called anencephaly. That is basically without a brain. Um, it is incompatible with life. Our skull bones are going to fail to form. The brain will not develop at all. And in fact, that neural tissue is completely exposed, exposed to the amniotic cavity. Um, we can have spinal rachiskisis, which is a failure of the entire neural tube to close. This is also unfortunately incompatible with life. Um, the vertebral bones do not form correctly. The entire length of the central nervous system is exposed to the amniotic cavity, okay? And we can also have spina bifida. Um, uh, spina bifida is a failure of the neural tube to close at a specific discrete point, okay? Usually that involves the posterior um, neural tube. Um, it keeps the vertebral bones from completely forming, specifically the vertebral arches. There are a number of genetic causes, um, but it's also due to uh, folate insufficiencies um, in utero. And so that's why there's a lot of folate. Um, pregnant women are, are uh, taking folate-rich vitamins, and a lot of milk and bread and orange juice now is supplemented with folate to prevent um, neural tube defects. Spina bifida can occur um, in, in several different flavors. We can have a spina bifida occulta where um, the central nervous system is fine, but only uh, the vertebral bones are damaged. Um, that's often not visible except for a tiny tuft of hair um, over the site of the damage. We can have a men meningocele where the meninges bulge out of the skin in a cyst-like pouch, and then a myelomeningocele um, where both meninges and neural tissue can bulge out into the cyst-like pouch. Okay. The, um, the next part of embryology I wanna talk about are the pharyngeal apparatus. So we have, uh, you know from earlier sessions that the pharyngeal uh, apparatus is a series of embryonic features that are going to remodel to form key structures in the head and neck. Each um, pharyngeal arch um, contains a little bit of head mesoderm, a little bit of neural crest derived mesoderm, a cranial nerve, a, an artery, which is often referred to as an aortic arch artery, a lining of endoderm and a covering of ectoderm. The, um, each arch has a, a pharyngeal pouch that is an internal groove separating adjacent arches and a pharyngeal cleft, which is an external depression defining uh, specific arches. The first pharyngeal arch gives rise um, to a maxillary process, which will grow into the maxillary bone, the zygomatic bone and portions of the temporal bone. The mandibular process, which will give rise to the mandible, but also two of the bones of the middle ear, ear the malleus and the incus. Um, and it is um, largely the mandibular process is largely uh, derived from um, neural crest cell um, derived uh, cartilage called mechal cartilage. Uh, the first pharyngeal arch also contributes to the external ear. The muscles of mastication and it is aligned with cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve. The first uh, pharyngeal arch artery largely disappears, but it does contribute a tiny little bit to the maxillary artery. The second pharyngeal arch, um, the cartilage here is neural crest derived and it is called Reichert's cartilage. It gives rise to the stapes of the middle ear and the upper part of the hyoid bone, which is the only uh, bone in your neck that doesn't make another bony articulation. It's just floating there, held by muscle. The second pharyngeal arch um, gives rise to the muscles of facial expression, and hence its cranial nerve is cranial nerve seven, or the facial nerve. 
The second arch artery also largely disappears, but does contribute a little bit to the hyoid and stapedial arteries. The third pharyngeal arch has a neural crest derived cartilage. It doesn't, it doesn't get a name though. I don't know why we didn't name that, that um, cartilage, but that cartilage contributes to the lower portion of the hyoid bone. It only gives rise to one muscle, which is the styloid pharyngeus muscle. Its cranial nerve is cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. But its biggest contribution is really through the third arch artery. That This artery is very large and we can find it contributing to the two common carotids, the common carotid arteries on each side, some of the internal carotid artery and all of the external carotid artery. The fourth and sixth pharyngeal arches also have neural crest, cell, neural crest cell derived cartilages. These are the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage. These are at the beginning of the trachea and all of the laryngeal cartilages that help to move your vocal cords back and forth. The major muscles are the pharyngeal constrictors which help us swallow um, and the, uh, the cricothyroid muscle which also assists in vocal cord movement. Its cranial nerve is cranial nerve 10, um, the vagus nerve. Um, the fourth arch arteries actually have um, differential fates. So the right arch artery becomes part of the subclavian artery and the left artery of the fourth arch becomes the aortic arch way down in your chest. So there's a big differential there. The sixth arch artery becomes the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. So the sixth, the sixth arch, arch vessels are really the pulmonary uh, circulation, the pulmonary outflow tract. Now we know from before that the um, arches also have clefts and pouches. So the first cleft, they used to think it made the external auditory canal, okay? But that is actually falling out of favor. That theory is falling out of favor. Um, they now believe that the uh, first cleft is just, just goes away and the auditory, external auditory canal is derived from the ectoderm of the first arch, not the first cleft. That's a, that's a little, that's a little new, new information that you're probably not going to hear um, in a lot of uh, external uh, third-party resources yet. Um, the first pouch gives rise to the middle ear, um, part of the eardrum, and the auditory tube. The second cleft is basically obliterated by the second arch tissue. So the second arch tissue, tissue overgrows um, and basically kind of rolls down uh, into what would be your chin. Um, the second pouch on the inside is seated with lymphoid tissue and these become the palatine tonsils. The third cleft is obliterated by the second arch tissue as well, but the pouch will elongate, will pull away from the endoderm, it will move inferiorly and form the parathyroid glands and the thymus. The fourth cleft again, is also obliterated by the second arch tissue, but the pouch, like the third, will pull away from the endoderm, move inferiorly, provide two more parathyroid glands, and some of the cells which will move into the thyroid gland um, as a structure called C cells. And that's it. I know it was a whirlwind, uh, but let's look at some questions here. Um, seriously a lot to ask of you to to teach in uh, a short time frame so I, know. Um, I was like ah <laughs> just summarizing have... um uh, kind of what students can focus on um I just want to say just focus on the the learning objectives if you guys have any questions about what to focus yeah. on I know for for all three we went through a lot of content over the last yeah. two and some hours so um focus on those and um, we'll try to make some comments in our YouTube videos so that you guys know what you really need to focus on and, um, and kind of use these details to help assign the meaning to it for whatever you guys are studying and, you know, really confirm, confirm that knowledge. But um, 
Sorry, Dr. Haggard. Yeah, so so some of these questions, um, spina bifida is is seen more often clinically because the other other uh, neural tube defects tend to be um, incompatible with life. Um, so um, even if um, a an, a fetus is brought to term, they do not live for very long after after birth. Um, The uh, spina bifidas are much more compatible with life. Um, the occulta is, is sometimes not even caught. Um, the, the others uh, can be surgically repaired. Uh, there may be some functional deficits, but they are um, they can live and thrive and, and be wonderful human beings. So this so um question, does the sixth arch extend all the way down into the chest? Um, it is, so I want you to remember, when we're talking about this embryologically, um, the embryo is, is, is about this big, okay? It's tiny. So everything is next to one another and it's all remodeling. And as the embryo grows, those structures seem to be pulled down into the chest um, or into the gut or, um, and so when all of this was happening, all of this was happening right next to everything. And it was, the pattern was finalized and then the embryo grew, okay? And so the arch no does not extend down to your chest, but after all the growth and remodeling, it gets pulled down into that position um, as the heart is developing. Perfect, thank you for that, Dr. Uh, Spudik. All right, um, so I think that concludes um, our first regional uh, anatomy tutoring session. So thank you so much to all of our presenters for, for your great work and expertise in this. I think this really uh, provided a, a just next level of knowledge to these students. And we're so excited that you guys are registering for the regional and we can't wait to see you guys there. So I see just one comment in here about when the next session will be. So we will actually join you next week because uh, due to that AAA conference that I mentioned earlier, we're going to be um, the us three uh, co-founders are going to be in Toronto. So uh, we'll join you next Sunday and you'll get the link to that sent out on Thursday this week. Um, and uh, then we'll get together and uh, find a time, a new time, uh, I believe, for the final session because we just realized that that is Easter Sunday. So um, oh. we will we will work on ad adopting that um, you know change in schedule and notify you guys as um, as soon as you guys can. And then one thing about how you've confirmed you've registered. If you're not sure if you have, um, if you send us an email or if you even just want to register again, then we can remove the duplicate. So. Uh, either of those would be would be perfect. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for staying an additional uh, 15 minutes about uh, on this Sunday evening. And I hope all of you guys have a great night and see you again soon. Yes. And remember, it's extended till Friday, the registration. So you do have time to register again if you need to. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.